Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Welcome to week four of the CSE Mining Over Canada. This is your captain, Glenn Jones. I also moonlight as president and CEO of Digi Geodata. We will be exploring parts of Northern Canada on this tour. So fasten your seatbelts. Our flight today, as we leave Northern Saskatchewan, will take us over Nunavut Territory, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon Territory. Nunavut was originally part of the Northwest Territories. We head north and then due east towards Baffin Island. When Nunavut officially became a territory on April the 11th, 1999, Nana Civic and Polaris zinc lead silver mines were both nearing the end of production and the Lupin gold mine was on care and maintenance. Diamond exploration was underway and kimberlites were being discovered in the Slave Province, Victoria Island and Northern Baffin Island. The Jericho Diamond Mine was in the permitting stage. Those mines have closed. There are currently four operating mines in Nunavut, all of which are gold. They include the Doris in the Hope Bay, the Meliadine in the Amarac, which is part of the Metal Bank complex. The Metal Bank gold mine just recently closed after producing over 3 million ounces of gold from 2010 to 2019. The Mary River Iron Mine shipped its first ore to market in August 2015. In 2004, diamond exploration peaked in Nunavut with over 100 million acres of claims and exploration permits being staked. Other than the Jericho Mine, several other kimberlites were discovered with only two having estimated resources, Q1-4 and Chidlia. A small uranium rush began in 2005 in the Hornby Bay in the Thelon Basin areas. Exploration for uranium dwindled in 2016, the Kigabak uranium project was not allowed to proceed, which essentially curtailed uranium exploration in Nunavut. Exploration continues for diamonds, gold, and base metals. Several projects are at the advanced stage, but have not progressed due to the lack of infrastructure to make them economic. Sitka Gold is exploring in the Coppermine River area. Nunavut ranks sixth in Canada for mineral production. We fly westward to the Northwest Territories. Diamond mining continues to provide the foundation for the Northwest Territories mining industry. The only current mineral production comes from three diamond mines, Ikadi, Daivik, and Gaucho Quay. It all began in November 1991 when geologists Chuck Fifty and Stuart Blesson found 81 small diamonds at Lac de Gras. This discovery ignited the greatest diamond staking rush in North American history. At the height of the rush, more than 75 million acres were staked with over 150 companies descending on the area, hoping to find a kimberlite pipe. Canada is the third largest diamond producer by value in the world after Botswana and Russia, largely due to the excess of the Northwest Territories diamond industry. Since 2004, Canadian diamond mines have produced over 200 million carats. We descend to look at the Diabek open pit mining operation. Mining of several of the kimberlites have engineering challenges due to their proximity to water. Lead zinc showing south of the Great Slave Lake around Pine Point area were known to the local First Nations long before any mineral claims had been staked in the area. They had been using lead obtained from the showings to fashion musket balls. Evidence of galena smelting, ashes, and blobs of lead were discovered around the mineralized outcrops in 1920. In 1899, a 20-foot shaft was sunk to collect samples from different depths. Through the years, extensive exploration and drilling led to the opening of the Pine Point Mine. Between 1964 and 1983, 4.5 billion pounds of lead and 10 billion pounds of zinc were produced. The first real mineral rush in the Northwest Territories occurred because of radium and silver discoveries at Great Bear Lake in 1930. This eventually led to several mines in the area, especially with the high demand for uranium in World War II. Two of the larger mines included the Echo Bay, which produced 23.5 million ounces of silver and 9 million pounds of copper from 1964 to 1974. The El Dorado produced 13.4 million pounds of uranium, 13 million ounces of silver and 4.7 million pounds of copper, along with nickel, lead and cobalt. The first gold mine to go into production was the Con mine in 1938 followed by the Negus mine in 1939 on the shores of Great Slave Lake near Yellowknife. The Con mine produced 5.3 million ounces of gold before closing in 2003. The neighboring giant mine, one of the more well-known and infamous gold mines, produced 7.1 million ounces of gold from 1948 until closure in 2004. 60 North Gold is exploring the Mon property in the Yellowknife area. 
you can see the city of Yellowknife below. Rare earth elements are being explored at the advanced Nechalaco project on Great Slave Lake. Moving further west to the Yukon border is the Kantung Mine, which straddles the border between the two provinces. From 1962 to 1986, production included 10.6 billion pounds of tungsten concentrate and 2.6 million pounds of copper. The Northwest Territories ranks fifth in Canada for mineral production. We will take a short hop over the border to the final leg of our tour in the Yukon. Sitka Gold is exploring in the Yukon. The Klondike Gold Rush was a turning event in the Yukon's history. A party led by Skookum Jim Mason discovered gold in Bonanza Creek, a tributary of the Klondike River in August of 1896. An estimated 30,000 to 40,000 people braved numerous hardships to reach the Klondike gold fields in the winter and spring of 1897 and 1898. The Keno Hill Camp was one of the great mining camps of Canada. It was not only Canada's second largest primary silver producer and one of the richest silver lead zinc vein deposits ever mined in the world, it was also one of the mainstays of the Yukon economy from the 1920s after the rapid decline of the Klondike gold field until the early 1960s. At its peak in the 1950s and early 1960s, it supported about 15% of the territorial population. It also produced more wealth than the Klondike. Following a small amount of hand mining between 1913 and 1917, larger scale production was almost continuous from 1919 to 1989, except during World War II. Total silver production from the Keno Hill camp was 214.1 million ounces from 38 mines. The Brewery Creek mine also produced 277 ounces of gold over its short life from 1996 to 2000. The Eagle Gold Mine is not only the Yukon's newest mine, but also Canada's. Its first gold pour was in the Q3 of 2019. Taku Gold is exploring properties in that area. The Ferro Mine opened in 1969. From the late 1960s until 1982, the mine became one of the largest lead zinc mines in the world. At one time, it was the largest open pit mine in the world. During its history, 320 million tons of waste rock was removed to access the ore. The mine remained in more or less constant production until 1982. Total production from the Ferro mine was 3.9 billion pounds of lead, 5.9 billion pounds of zinc, and 52 million ounces of silver. Mining declined in the Yukon during the 1980s and 1990s, except for two mines. The Whitehorse Copper Mine produced 270 million pounds of copper, 3 million ounces of silver, and 253 ounces of gold between 1967 and 1982. The Yukon continues to attract significant exploration and development dollars with several projects at an advanced stage. This ends our tour today. Take some time to take in the historic towns of Dawson City and Whitehorse. Ditchy Geodata has complete endowment reports and renowned exploration activity maps available for many of the areas we have visited over the past four weeks. If you'd like a copy of the reports or maps of these areas to further explore, send an email to Dan Zeptelmi or myself at sales at digigeodata.com for a complimentary copy. We hope you have enjoyed your flight today. Don't forget to book your seat for the fifth and final tour of the CSE Mining Over Canada.